I'm working out. Let's hope it's not gonna crash. Um, okay, so I can see uh, the chat window, but um, student assistant uh, Luke uh, Altenburg is going to help me to reply to answers. If you have answers during the lectures, please post them in the chat window. I see the chat window on uh, one screen here. So I have uh, the iPad, I have the laptop, and I have two additional screens. So I can see actually the chat window here. I can see the number of participants. We have now 53 participants here. Then uh, the thing is also that we should test first is uh, just, you know, you can um, on Zoom, you can give a thumbs up if everything works fine for you. Then I will see that uh, you can hear me and you can see me and you can see also the iPad screen. Okay, I get some hands up here. I do see some stop hands as well, but I see thumbs up. Okay, that seems to work. Perfect. Okay. Luke is also working for you. I haven't seen your hand. Okay. Um, so then finally, uh, the, the <laughs> use the iPad here to uh, lecture. Now, last time Sike discussed um, the idea cycles. So he started with the introduction and then we had the idea cycles here. And uh, in the ideal cycles, of course, uh, we idealize a lot. Uh, we can use or we have to use the um, uh, first uh, law of thermodynamics for an open system. And uh, Sika has just introduced the first law of an open system, which can be always used, but can also be used, for example, so in a, in a real cycle, of course, you have losses, right? And losses is not uh, necessarily the right word because energy cannot get lost. As we know, energy cannot be produced uh, from nowhere and the energy cannot be lost to nowhere. So it's only basically a, a com, uh, translation or let's say transfer of energy from one form to another. Most of the time when we talk about losses, kinetic energy is, for example, lost or transferred, not lost, but transferred into uh, internal energy and then the gas heats up, right? We have, if you think about something, a flow that is that has losses, what happens is that some of the kinetic energy of the flow is uh, converted into internal energy of the gas, makes the molecules vibrate faster. Um, so, um, what I wanted to discuss here now is a few examples, but uh, we had, uh, these are the cycles that Sika discussed last time. So if you think about a TS diagram here, so this could be a TS or a HS diagram. Most of the time for an ideal cycle, this could be the entropy on this axis. This is the cycle itself, right? You can see the cycle here. This is a, a Brayton cycle. And this has been discussed also in thermodynamics for the first year bachelor already. So this is for the um, uh, TU Delft students, uh, not uh, new really. We have seen this already many times probably, but this is the entropy on the X axis and on the Y axis, if it's a ideal cycle, an ideal cycle has several assumptions. We say that for an ideal cycle, we have also constant properties for, uh, for the flow. For example, that the heat capacity, the isobaric heat capacity CP is constant. This is one of the assumptions that we have. So the ratio of, um, uh, for example, gamma, the ratio of specific heats is also constant. And if CP is constant, then we can use the equation, which is called H is the enthalpy. And the enthalpy is defined as the internal energy of the gas plus pressure times specific volume. We have here also CP times T. And I hope you can see it. So H is equal CP times T which means there's just a linear scaling on the y-axis if I use CP or if I don't use CP. So I can use both. I can use H, the entropy, and I can use the temperature here on the y-axis to draw my Brighton cycle. So I can use specify, simply specify here the temperatures one, here temperature two, and so on and so forth, right? And then I have temperature one, two, and three, and four. So this would be the compression, the heat addition, the expansion, and this one here would be the heat rejection, which you know already. 
But um, then CK was also able to uh, derive a very nice equation uh, which defines or calculates the thermal efficiency of such a Brighton cycle. And if we have an ideal cycle, then it's very easy for all of these ideal cycles to derive an explicit equation for the thermal efficiency, the theoretic thermal efficiency for an ideal cycle, which is then most of the time just a function of the temperature ratio or the pressure ratio in this case, because temperature ratio and pressure ratio are very closely linked to each other with an isentropic relations. And uh, then Sike has uh, discussed also, uh, there was one of his questions that how do you compare the Carnot cycle efficiency to the Brayton cycle efficiency, okay? Um, on the other hand, you can see also here, this, has, this cycle has, um, um, so depending on the pressure ratio, right? So the higher the pressure ratio, the higher the efficiency. And uh, this cycle is the red cycle. So the red cycle is also given here as a function of efficiency, the efficiency as a function of pressure ratio. And you see that the, the higher the pressure ratio, the higher the efficiency, okay? That really doesn't uh, depend on, on what is the maximum temperature in the cycle. It's only the higher the pressure ratio, the higher the efficiency. And if the efficiency goes to infinity, uh, if the pressure ratio goes to infinity here, then of course you will finally reach an asymptotic value for the efficiency of one. Then we have, um, uh, Sika has also discussed that for the ideal cycle, there's actually an optimal value for the pressure ratio where maximum power can be extracted, maximum specific power or specific work in this case, okay? And this should be not, uh, I'm not very careful here to define this, but here it's written specific power, but it should be really specific work that we have to talk about here. And that is where you can see that this is the maximum amount where specific work can be extracted for an ideal cycle at a given pressure ratio. And Sik has simply explained it. You can have different, um, let me, um, let me go to this here. So you can see here, um, just, I'm just quickly um, uh, repeating what Sik already mentioned. So you can have here again, the temperature and the entropy, or you can also just simply say, this is nothing else than CP times temperature is also the entropy. And then you can have a, a cycle, which is something like that. One, two, three, and four. I'm going faster a bit, but if you have questions, please um, uh, post the question there in the chat window. And I'm looking for like every, here and then to the chat window if you have questions, okay? Then let's say if I want to keep the, the temperature ratio at this, the, 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 the maximum temperature, because the maximum temperature is usually limited by the constraints of how much the material can sustain. So this temperature ratio here will be, I don't know, 1600 degrees Celsius or for very modern machines or much lower for older machines. And the inlet temperature, of course, is given by the ambient conditions. So T is equals T ambient, for example. Okay. Now, this cycle has a certain pressure ratio because the isobars are given here. So this is P1 and this is P2, right? This is the pressure ratio between the compressor and the uh, turbine. They have both the same pressure ratio in an ideal cycle because there are no pressure losses in the combustion chamber and there are no losses them in the in the comp compressor and in the turbine. So this is one cycle, but now I can say, okay, I want to have another cycle with a higher, um, with a higher uh, pressure ratio. And then I start again at the same point, but I say, I want to have a prior, higher pressure ratio and I go to this point. Now I can add some of my heat either by fuel or some external heat source to heat up the fluid again along an, an const, uh, an, a constant pressure line, an isobar until I hit the, max, hit the maximum temperature, I cannot increase the temperature any further. And I will get a cycle that will look like that. And this is something that I will discuss later as well when we talk about the homework assignment. In the homework assignment, this is something that you will have to do, okay? Uh, but now you can see there is, uh, this is a cycle with a very high pressure ratio, the blue one. And this thermal efficiency is much larger than the thermal efficiency of the red cycle, because the red cycle is has a lower pressure ratio. 
But the maximum specific work that can be extracted from this cycle, from both of the cycles, is actually given by the area within the cycle. So you will see that this area is much larger, is much larger than for the blue cycle. The specific work for the red cycle is much larger because the area is much larger than for the blue cycle. And there is an optimum and the optimum has been found. When is the highest, when is this, this, this uh, area the largest? For example, I can draw another, another uh, uh, cycle with a very low um, pressure ratio. Let's do it black here. This cycle has a very low pressure ratio. So I go from pressure one to pressure two here. This is P2. Of course, the pressure lines are increasing up there, right? And the pressure lines are diverging in a TS or HS diagram because of the first law of uh, thermodynamics, which can be easy to show. But let's say this would be another, the, the, so the pressure lines should diverge actually, so I'm not doing it nice, but it should go something like that. Heat again, the maximum temperature. Otherwise I would melt my turbine blades or the combustion chamber even. And then I expand ideally, I have an ideal expansion so no losses, entropy is not increasing during my expansion process and I hit this point. Now I have a black cycle and the black cycle you can see again is very thin here. And the specific power for this cycle is again much smaller than the one, the red one. Okay, so the maximum specific work that can be extracted from an ideal Brayton cycle is when the temperature at the outlet of the compressor is the same as the temperature at the outlet of the turbine. When T2 equals T4, then we know that we have reached this point here. This point for maximum specific power at a given pressure ratio happens when the cycle is such that the outlet temperature of the compressor is the same as the outlet temperature of the turbine. Okay. Then, of course, Sika has discussed several other things. We have um, uh, uh, turbines with a, we have a cycles with a recuperator. And uh, also, that can be easily seen. For example, if you talk about the recuperator here, then let me use another color black here. You see that again, this is the compression. Then this part, this is the heating process, right? This is an isobar, constant pressure line. So it's a heat exchanger or combustion chamber, which in an ideal cycle is a constant, is a constant pressure because there are no pressure losses. But the first part of the heat addition can actually happen from using the energy in the exhaust heat of the turbine, which is this part here. So this exhaust heat of the turbine can be used either in a bottoming cycle, for example, if you have a uh, combined combined power uh, uh, power combined cycle power plant where you have a gas turbine and a steam turbine, which means that this part this heat here goes to the steam turbine, but in this case this heat from the outlet of the temperature until you almost read ambient temperature again is not going to the steam turbine here in this case, but it goes to the recuperator to the hot pressure to the high pressure part. Okay, some of this heat from the exhaust is actually transferred to the high pressure side after the compressor, which means that you need less heat addition from uh, fuel or anything else. This is the heat addition that we need. So we have reduced the amount of fuel that we need to add. And we know that the efficiency is defined on useful work divided by how much fuel we need to put in. Um, and in this case, of course, the amount of fuel has reduced. So the efficiency is much higher now. And then you go to, again to the expansion and you can close the cycle. And so this is initially, this was the blue line here, right? This blue line is recuperated cycle, this one here. This is the recuperated cycle. And if you look at the recuperated cycle here, then you can see this is the efficiency. The efficiency here is much higher for lower pressure ratios. Let's say if I choose a pressure ratio of 10 here, if I choose a pressure ratio of 10, then I will have a much higher efficiency for my recuperated cycle, assuming there are no losses, which is this part here. 
almost 65 or even higher than 65 percent as compared to the to the basic rating cycle which is this guy here is 50 percent in this case of course in an IES cycle in reality it's not like that but if you add a recuperator you can increase the thermal efficiency by quite a substantial amount of uh, uh, quite a substantial amount and on the other hand you can also see that uh, recuperation will only work as long as the outlet temperature here of the compressor is lower than the outlet temperature of the turbine. If this outlet temperature of the compressor keeps on getting higher and higher and higher, we will not be able to recuperate anymore because then the outlet temperature of the compressor is already higher than the outlet temperature of the turbine, which means that when these two lines here intersect, the red line and the blue line where they intersect, this is also basically telling you that T2 is equals T4, which is this one here. You can see I have here 20, I don't know, approximately 22, and I also have here 22 maximum power. You can see it again also here. Of course, for the blue cycle, for this blue cycle, I will not be able to use a recuperator because the temperature at the compressor outlet is already much higher than the temperature at the turbine outlet. I hope you can follow. Are there any questions? Okay, I see some notes here, which means that I can go ahead. So this is something that Zika has discussed last time. I just went quickly through this part now. And um, um, I see that my battery is also going very... And uh, So then I can uh, go ahead and I can discuss uh, now things that, um, um, uh, again, here just a few pictures, for example, on um, the different cycles. So this one here is an uh, uh, ideal Brayton cycle, as we discussed, and I'm using here a gas turbine for uh, aircraft propulsion, where you can see here, for example, the, the big fan here, this is the fan. Then here you have the booster, the compressor. So these are three stages for the compressor. Here you actually have a gearbox. This is a, one, a very modern Pratt & Whitney uh, 1000. And the G here stands for gearbox because this guy has a gearbox, which means that uh, the fan can be made bigger uh, because it can run at a lower rotational speed in order to avoid Mach number one here. So if you imagine you have very long blade length or very, you have a very large fan, the rotational speed of the fan is reduced by uh, by by head by keeping actually the Mach number of this tip of the fan below one. Right? If you rotate the fan too fast, the longer the blade, the much higher the chances that you reach Mach number one here at the tip of this fan. Uh, which means that uh, if you want to make it bigger, you need to rotate it slower, and that's why they put a gearbox here. So they have built a gearbox there and it's already being tested and actually also being used at uh, some aircraft. But because they, they have the gearbox here, it means that actually the, the main turbine, the power turbine, right? So this is the compressor, the whole thing here, this is the power turbine with the compressor, the combustion chamber and the, the turbine can rotate at much higher rotational speed. So they can be made smaller, they can rotate at higher rotational speeds. And this is how you can optimize them. And if you do that, um, then uh, you can actually reduce the number of compressors here. You can see that there are only a few, three booster uh, stages. And then you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight stages of the high pressure compressor. Then you have the combustion chamber. And then you have here the turbine. And these three turbine stages actually are used to drive the fan. It's a basic Brighton cycle in this case. And then I told you before, so there's also, I discussed only quickly the, the, the um, recuperation, but then you can also have reheat, right? When you have the compressor, the heat addition, you expand not all the way down to ambient pressure, but only to 
to, to, to another pressure which is higher. And then you add another combustion chamber and then you expand all the way down. And this will be a reheat cycle in a PES diagram, right? So you can see the compressor, first heat addition, which is this combustion chamber. The first one here, this is a gas turbine GT26, it's called. And um, uh, in this combustion chamber, you basically add the fuel in this part. Then you expand in the second, in the first turbine stage, which is this one here. You can see this turbine, which is this part. And then you have the second combustion chamber, which is this part here. I hope you can see it in this figure. And then this is this part, which adds heat here. And then you have the final turbine stages, these are four or five turbine stages here, where actually you produce the power that to drive the generator. Okay, so this is a reheat cycle. Then where would you use a recuperated cycle? Recuperated cycles have been uh, our, of course, the idea of a recuperated cycle has been out there for a long time, but adding these big heat exchangers between a low pressure side and the high pressure side makes it actually quite expensive. So the equipment of the heat exchanger can become very expensive. So it's not very useful to implement a recuperator in a normal gas turbine, uh, gas turbine, for example, but in a special cycle, it is essential to use it. And this is what I call here the uh, supercritical power cycle. Okay, so it's being developed in the US and other places in the world where they want to use instead of a ranking cycle, the red one here is the ranking cycle uh, in the temperature entropy diagram. And the ranking cycle, of course, operates in the two phase uh, region. So this is the condenser, this is the evaporator, for example. But now if you increase the pressure, you will end up all of a sudden in the supercritical fluid region, which is this part here. And these cycles have a very low pressure ratio. And remember what I said, if you have a low pressure ratio, you can use, uh, you can use uh, a recuperator. I would need to switch uh, my screen share, just one second. Okay. Let me. <clears throat> okay, so another, so this was the example of the recuperated cycle. I said that the pressure ratio is very low. For low pressure ratio, it essentially means that the temperature, the outlet of the compressor is much lower then the temperature at the outlet of the turbine, which means all of these parts here can be used to recuperate. And the recuperation usually means uh, much higher efficiency than a basic cycle. So the only necessary heat addition in this cycle that is, is happening here. And uh, this cycle has been developed now in order for solar energy. So there's this part, this heat addition here is coming from solar energy. It's a solar thermal power plant where they will use this power cycle or for heat uh, recovery systems as well. Now, the other cycle, so um, 
the this is a, a, a turbine that doesn't exist, but it was studied in the European Union quite many years ago. Uh, and it's a concept study uh, where they wanted to use, for example, um, a, a, con, a, a turbine, gas turbine for aircrafts, which uh, is using a lot of these uh, tricks in order to make the efficiency higher. The current gas turbines for aircraft engines have very high pressure ratios. They can go up to 60. For very high pressure ratios, it means you cannot use a recuperator. But what they do in, in, in these aircraft engines is that they actually go to pressure ratios which are beyond the pressure ratio where you have maximum specific power. So actually the specific power is going down again. But of course, we saw before that the thermal efficiency goes up the higher the pressure ratio. So they actually use higher pressure ratios to get higher efficiency, but lower specific power. So, and this project want to do something else in this project. So this is not yet flying, but the concept was like that, that you get the air in here, of course, at the inlet, this is the fan. And uh, air at uh, ambient conditions at takeoff, for example, or at uh, much lower temperatures at flight uh, altitude, it will go inside the compressor here then the air will not continue here. So let's say this is the booster. The air will not continue to the high pressure compressor, which is this part here, HP, high pressure compressor. And this could be the booster. No, the air is actually diverted away towards this area here. And here we have a heat exchanger because the air at flight altitude is at very low temperatures which means that the air after the booster can be cooled down to lower temperatures. So you have an intercooler and then you continue with an air that has a much lower density to further compress to higher pressures here. So we have an intercooler here. Again, if you have this one here, you can have the compressor. This is point 0.1, point 0.2, but you don't compress all the way up. 2.3. Instead, you intercool it to a very low temperature, let's say here, and then you compress it again. And you will see that the work, of course, of the compressor is related with the temperature difference. This one is again the temperature here. This one is the entropy. You can see that this delta T is much smaller than this delta T here. Right? because you cool down the gas to a lower temperature, um, it means that um, um, the density is higher, so you need less energy actually to increase the pressure. It can be explained also using uh, kinetic theory of gases, of molecules, but I'm not gonna go there. But the, also for, for liquid, actually a liquid is very easy to compress. You don't need to use a lot of uh, work in order to compress a liquid because uh, most of the work to compress a gas goes into increase of kinetic energy of the molecules. But anyway, so here you can see that uh, the intercooler is used to reduce the overall compressor work. So there's uh, several questions here. Why is the choice made to only heat up part of the bypass air and not all of it? I'm not completely sure which is the bypass air. This is, let's say all of the air that goes through the booster is actually going through this intercooler. I hope this is the question related to this cycle. So the intercooler has the complete amount of the air that enters the booster. Of course, the bypass ratio of an aircraft engine is defined on how much mass goes only through the fan and how much mass goes through the uh, power turbine. Right, so the power turbine has a much smaller mass flow rate, let's say this one here. And the fan has a much larger mass flow rate, this is this part here, this one. And that's so-called bypass ratio. And the reason why the, the, the higher the bypass ratio, the higher the propulsive efficiency. So that's why also the geared turbofan to make the fan much larger so that the mass flow through the fan increases which means that the propulsive efficiency increases. 
But in this case, if I understood the question correctly, is all of the air that goes through the booster here actually goes through the heat exchanger here and um, uh, is cooled down and then it continues here in the high pressure turbine. And then you can see another thing is, so before you actually start burning fuel in the combustion chamber, when you say booster, do you mean the air that goes through the high pressure section of the turbine? No, the booster is the first, the booster are the first stages of the compressor here. If this is my axis, then these are the first three stages of the compressor and this is the booster. Then I have here more stages of the compressor. Then I have here the combustion chamber. And then I have here the turbine stages. And this will be the inlet. The booster is the first, are the first stages of the, compre of the compressor and the aircraft the gas turbine. Then you have the high pressure compressor. Then you have the high pressure turbine. And then you have the low pressure turbine. This one here, the high pressure turbine, low pressure turbine are these three stages. This one here, maybe. What is the temperature after the intercooler? It depends on how effective the, the, the heat exchanger works. Maybe you have a temperature at, uh, in, at, at, at the, of the air is maybe minus 20 or even lower, minus 20 degree at uh, 10,000 uh, meter altitude, the temperature is very low. So if you have an intercooler with an effectiveness of one, that would mean that you would be able to cool down the air after the intercooler to minus 20 degree. And then you've got an air for minus 20 degree that goes into the compressor. But this is not going to happen because of the effectiveness of this heat, uh, intercooler is much lower. And also, you don't want to go to low temperatures. Otherwise, you can also have icing effects. I mean, the air that does not go through the combustion, but only through the fan. Ah, yes. And Jasper, I need to discuss this later because I still don't completely get it. Um, let's discuss this in the in the break, which we have actually quite soon. Then is a booster only used when an intercooler uh, is used? Does normal braking cycle also separate the booster? Yes, for example, um, so you don't need to use an you don't need to have a booster only if you have an intercooler. For example, in this cycle that I showed before, this one here, this is also a booster, but there's no intercooler here, right? So you can see this is the booster. This is the this part. Can you see this channel here? This is the air that goes in here. Then you have the booster stages, which are these three. So it's the low pressure compressor. Then the air continues in this case and goes here to the high pressure compressor, which is this part. Okay. And uh, because this is such a uh, highly, highly efficient engine and it uses a gearbox here, uh, they have a lot of space unused here. You see all that space here is actually unused. They could even make it shorter. The reason why I use this uh, picture here is because this space also is so large that actually they could use an intercooler here. They could actually go put some of the air up here where the flow from the fan goes through and cool the air down before it goes into the high pressure compressor. Is it clear? But they don't use an intercooler here. This is the booster, high pressure compressor, combustion chamber, high pressure turbine, low pressure turbine. Um, then let me continue because I'm really, really, ah, and this is how such a, such a thing it would look like. So this is the, this is the, um, uh, concept study from the European Union, which is a large European project with a lot of companies involved that are uh, working on gas turbines and combustion chambers. And there are even company, very companies, very highly specialized only on the compressor or only on the turbine, for example. But this is what you can see here. So this is the fan. Of course, the big thing here is the fan. Then here you would see uh, the, the booster somewhere here is inside here. So you have the first compressor stages inside here. Then you can see this blue thing here. Let me use a different color. This thing here is are the intercoolers. These here are the intercoolers, these blue things. 
So they are trying to cool down the temperature after the booster. This here, Zach goes in here, it's cooled down and it goes back to the high pressure compressor. Then it goes inside the, com before it goes inside the combustion chamber, I didn't mention that before, before it goes inside the combustion chamber, you use a recuperator. So let's say here, the, rec the recuperator, something like that. So that some of the air from this temperature now to this one here is the recuperator. And then this part here to heat it up to the maximum temperature is the combustion chamber, this one here. So you see that you have reduced the amount of fuel from this part to only this part, right? Which means increasing efficiency because some of the heat is added in the recuperator. So the air after the compressor doesn't go to the combustion chamber immediately, but actually go, goes to a heat exchanger off at the exhaust of the gas turbine to heat up the gas. Then it goes back and then it goes inside the combustion chamber. And this one here is the combustion chamber here. You burn some fuel and then you go inside the turbine, high pressure turbine, intermediate pressure turbine and low pressure turbine. And the low pressure turbine, as you can see, is actually used again with a gearbox here to drive the fan. And this thing, it would have a very, very high efficiency. But as you can imagine, if you look at this picture here, it's also quite complicated to build. You add a lot of additional weight on the airplane because of all these heat exchangers. You have the, the, the intercoolers that you need to carry with you. You have also the, uh, re the recuperator that you need to carry because this here is the exhaust, right? Hot gas at the exhaust is actually used by the intercool uh, by, the, by the recuperator here and so on and so forth. So it's very complicated to build something like this, but uh, maybe it's the future now, let's see. Um, so, now, um, I am going to finally to the second part of this, which is the real cycles. And um, again, I showed you, this is an ideal cycle, which I have uh, drawn many times now with a compressor, with the heat exchanger. Then this one here is the turbine power that is required to drive the compressor. And this part here is the power that we can get out of this whole thing, right? It can be used to drive a fan, a helicopter rotor or a, a generator or whatever. This is the power that we can use. And this is then uh, closed again, not really closed, but it is uh, think, thought of being a closed cycle, although actually the exhaust is going to the engine. But then of course you don't have this case. You have a bunch of things that happen. You have a gas turbine has actually an inlet and in the inlet you can even filter or heat up the air or cool down the air before it goes into the compressor. And at the inlet, you have pressure losses here. I will discuss this in a bit more detail later, um, which means that in the TS diagram here, if you have isobars like that, then you start here, this will be your ambient temperature. This will be your ambient pressure. But if you now do, uh, if the, 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 the inlet of the gas turbine has pressure losses, we basically you go horizontal way here. If the total entropy stays constant, and then you end up with a much lower pressure at the inlet of the compressor already. So you need to compress more, which means these are losses. This is the inlet. Then you finally arrive at the inlet of the compressor and then you compress. But of course, if you assume that the compressor is uh, perfectly insulated, there's no heat transfer across the compressor from the outside, then losses would make the point three end up to the right of point two, this one here. Let me draw it like this. And this delta here is delta S of the compressor. And the delta S of the compressor can be related to total pressure losses again. So you actually, due to the boundary layers, due to the boundary layers and uh, due to the, uh, um, wakes of the blades and so on and so forth, which I will discuss later in more detail, you have a lot of uh, losses inside a compressor, which makes the line not go straight up like that, but it makes the line go up like that, which is this one here. Then you are in the combustion chamber where you add the heat, 
And in the combustion chamber, you have also losses, which are the delta PCC. So this, uh, this is the pressure loss in the combustion chamber, which means you also end up at a lower pressure at the outlet of the combustion chamber. So now the turbine has a lower pressure ratio than the compressor, because the compressor had to compress more to overcome the pressure rate, the loss here. And then you are in the turbine, and in the turbine, again, if you assume that the turbine is um, um, perfectly insulated, so there's no heat transfer across the boundary, then you can see that it goes from four to five, and the entropy has increased again, delta S, is plus, is larger than zero, and you have losses here. And these are the losses that uh, we talk in real uh, turbines, okay? So you can see these are the assumptions that we made. Hydro gas, CP and CV are constant, the mass flow is constant, which is not true in a real uh, gas turbine because you actually add the fuel here. There's also the mass, the fuel, mass flow rate of the fuel here. Expansion and compressions are adiabatic, which is not, uh, most of the time true because actually you have large heat losses uh, uh, on the turbine and also on the compressor, which means you go this way or this way. No pressure losses. These are also the things that are, uh, are this, these are the assumptions for an ideal cycle, right? That you have no pressure losses, heat exchanger efficiency is 100%, and that the kinetic energy of the gas itself doesn't play a role. All of these things are uh, big assumptions, but in reality, this is not the case. And uh, <clears throat> one of the things, for example, we assume that CP is constant throughout the whole cycle so that uh, the gas that goes through the compressor, it's pure air and pure air has a certain CP value, but also for pure air, the CP value is actually a fun function of temperature, okay? For perfect, calorically perfect gas, the CP is only a function of temperature which means the higher the temperature, the higher the value of CP. Uh, for, for, for if, it's a, if the gas is not calorically perfect, then the CP also depends on the pressure and the temperature, which I will show you later. But anyway, the CP also is a function of temperature. So when you go inside the compressor, one, two, you increase the temperature, the CP value changes. You cannot assume that CP is constant. Moreover, if you are in the turbine, and you expand in the turbine, you see there's a large temperature difference from the inlet of the turbine to the outlet of the turbine, which means CP also changes, but moreover, the gas is not the same anymore as in the compressor. In the compressor, you have pure air, and here you have a uh, combustion products. Uh, so you have uh, water vapor in there, you have CO2, you have uh, maybe uh, a NOx in there, and uh, the composition of the gas that goes through the turbine is very much different which means also the CP here is very much different. So it's not the same anymore as here, and is also a function of temperature, as you know. And this is just to show you here, for example, the CP that we usually use for the turbine here, we still use, we still can assume that it's constant, but this is the CP that we would use here for the turbine, and this is the CP that we would use here for the compressor, 1004.5, and this can be easily calculated by CP is equals uh, gamma times gas constant divided by gamma minus one. And gamma, we already said is 1.4. R is 287 uh, joule per kilogram Kelvin, right? And then you can calculate um, the CP value, which is this one here, 1004.5. And if you look at the temperature dependence, so this is not constant, but in, in fact, it also depends on the temperature. And this is here CP on this axis. And um, this is shown here. And so you can see that the CP increases as the temperature increases because here you have temperature, CP increases. So if you want to be very accurate, you actually need to take into account the CP changes. <clears throat> okay. Um, now I would suggest that we have a break here. Uh, and I will be able to charge my computer a bit more. And we have a break and I will answer to some of these questions that are here, okay? So let's have a break of 15 minutes. We are back at 9.45, I continue with the lecture and then uh, uh, in the meantime, I will answer to some of the questions here or maybe I will write down some of the questions and then answer them after 15 minutes of break, okay? <clears throat>
Mm-hmm. <clears throat>
Okay, let's. Um... <clears throat> We still have two minutes uh, in the break, but I would uh, suggest that uh, I start answering the questions. Uh, one of the questions here, which I think uh, now I understand with the help of uh, Luke is why is there a separation here? Why is there a separation even in this engine, which does not have an intercooler, as I said, but you have the compressor here Um, <clears throat> you have this compressor here. And um, yeah. So I will uh, answer these uh, questions now. Um, so why is there a separation between the booster here and uh, the high pressure compressor, right? Even if there's no intercooler, there's no intercooler in between here. Uh, the thing is that in this engine, uh, they have optimized it even further uh, so that they can have, it's called a two spool engine. This part of the engine with a high pressure compressor and the first two stages here, or maybe only one stage, I don't know exactly, but I think it's only one stage even, are connected on one shaft. The shaft is outside. This is one shaft. And then there's an inside shaft Okay, so there are two shafts inside. That's the, 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 this shaft or this axis is inside the outer axis. So the engine here with the high pressure compressor and the high pressure turbine are rotating at a higher rotational speed than the booster. And that's why they are not connected because they are at different shafts and rotating at different shaft speed in order to optimize, to get the right shaft speed for this design. In this pressure ratio. And the reason why we, is it clear now? So they are not connected because they are simply not at the same shaft. They're rotating at different speeds. Then why do we use a gearbox? And that is, um, uh, if we don't use a gearbox and we have this turbine here, this part connected with the fan, you can see that the fan will have to rotate either at a very high rotational speed so that this turbine operates at uh, very well conditions, but then you have a problem. If this turbine has to rotate very fast in order to get to get its own max, uh, per perfect operation condition, the fan would have rotated very fast if there's no gearbox in between, which means that the fan cannot be very large because the larger the fan blades become, the higher the tip speed. And if the tip speed becomes too high, it could be that the tip speed is faster than the speed of sound. If the tip speed is faster than the speed of sound, you create shock waves. Shock waves mean very large losses. Losses. That's why you use a gearbox. You use a gearbox that you can have this turbine operate at very high rotational speeds. And then you lower the rotational speed in the gearbox so that the fan can rotate at lower rotational speeds and you can make the fan very long so that the tip speed of the fan stays below the speed of sound. Is it clear now? Hands up. Okay. Now I can also see how many people are listening. It's not very interactive, I know, right? And maybe for some of you, you have seen this already also. Um, but let me continue now. The other question is um, the gearbox. Yes, it's clear now, that's all okay. Then I showed a graph. <clears throat> In this graph, there are three lines. There's one line here, second line, and the third line. And these are three lines for CP values. Isobaric heat capacity is here, and this is in kilojoule per kilogram Kelvin now. 
It starts at 1,000 joule, 1,400 joule per kilogram Kelvin. And there are three lines. You can clearly see that this, each of these lines is a function of temperature, right? Uh, but you can also see that um, uh, there are three lines and these three different lines are given here. They are different fuel air ratios. So the composition has changed. You can see here 0 0.027 and this one is 0 0.13. And uh, I don't know what is this last one here. But you can see that um, this, one, uh, this one is for zero. So this is one is for, for air, I would say. And the other one is for if you have a combustion a combustion process and you have added fuel at a certain fuel to air ratio, then you get this line uh, and then you get this line here. So you see that this is for air, 1004.5. And if you have add fuel, the CP goes up. So this is by increasing fuel air ratio. Clear? That's why there are three lines. And the same three lines you can see also for gamma. Gamma is decreasing. And gamma is on this axis, and you can see gamma for air is 1.4, and gamma for flue gas is around 1.33. And that's something that you will have to use also in the um, homework assignment, which I need to discuss um, before the end of this lecture. Then um, <clears throat> let me uh, skip this part. Maybe this is an extreme example on how CP can change. For example, if you look at the isobaric heat capacity here, as again, as a function of temperature, this is function of temperature, and you see the isobaric heat capacity. And if you are at an isobar, this is again an isobar, this red line is an isobar in a TS diagram, TS diagram. And usually we look at CP somewhere here or somewhere here as a function of temperature and then CP simply increases. But if the isobar is at a very high pressure because this is pressure increase and then you are at a supercritical pressure and now you start plotting for T1 to whatever T2, which is this one T1 and this is T2 and you start plotting along this line the isobaric heat capacity. What you will see the blue line is the isobaric heat capacity. It makes something like that even. So it's a strong nonlinear function of CP. So you cannot simply use H is equals CP times T. In this case, this would be very wrong because CP makes this weird uh, behavior here. This would be wrong. This works only for ideal gas. This is not an ideal gas. If you are at an isobar above the critical point, then you cannot use this one. Uh, and you will have to use something else in order to calculate the enthalpy change in a compressor, for example, or in a heat exchanger. Um, yeah, so this is also, oh, and these slides are broken. So this end is a point here. So you can see that um, this is eta, isentropic compressor. How do we define the efficiency of a compressor? And I'm sure all the master students have all seen this already. You have a, a TS diagram again, entropy and enthalpy or temperature. You have these two isobars. This will be for an isentropic compression from one to two. And this is a compression with losses. And now you end up at point two here and two prime, two prime indicates isentropic compression. And so since you have losses, you now somehow need to quantify the losses. And the way you quantify the losses is with an eta, eta efficiency, isentropic compressor efficiency. And the isentropic compressor, compressor efficiency is nothing else than uh, if you have ideal gas, you can again cancel out the CP. If you assume that CP is constant, then you can simply write that the isentropic efficiency of a compressor is nothing else than T to prime minus T1 divided by T2 minus T1. You can see the temperature difference between one and two is this one here is much larger than the temperature different for an isentropic compression, which is this one here. So the efficiency can never be larger than one, which means that you always take the 
lower temperature ratio first, which is T2 prime divided minus T1 divided by T2 minus T1. So this efficiency is always smaller than one. And the same for the turbine, just for the turbine, you need to do it the other way around. And um, uh, then you can also do some other things where you can actually express, uh, uh, you can use isentropic relations and uh, using this isentropic relations, actually, you can also make this isentropic efficiency as a function of pressure ratio. I will do this in the next slide here. So for example, if you take um, the, 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 the compressor work, for example, is, um, now there's uh, divided by mass flow. So you can see that um, this one is uh, CP times uh, T, in this case, I use three and two as an index because I take into account also the inlet. The inlet starts at one, then the inlet of the compressor is a two and the outlet of the compressor is a three. And then I would have here T03 minus T02. And if I want to write this in a different way, then I can also say uh, times T03 divided by T02 minus one. I have taken T out, right? CP times T02 times this uh, ratio here, minus one. And this ratio is nothing else than an isentropic relation for the pressure ratio. And if you know that P3 divided by T2 is nothing else than T03 divided by T02 to the power of, anybody knows what I have to put here? It's an exponent. The exponent of the temperature ratio has to be what? Question to you. Yes, correct. I got an answer which is a gamma minus one or kappa minus one. I always write kappa and then I say gamma uh, divided by kappa or gamma. Let's say gamma minus one divided by gamma. So, which means that the pressure ratio I said already for modern air aircraft engines, the pressure ratio can, up be, can be up to 60 or 40 uh, for, for others. Um, so the temperature ratio is 1600 uh, divided by uh, 200 in Kelvin, let's say, or 1800 Kelvin divided by 200 or 300 Kelvin, which means that the temperature ratio is always much smaller than the pressure ratio, right? Which means that this exponent here is actually not correct. I listen to Constantine, but actually this ex exponent has to be larger than one, which means it has to be kappa divided by kappa minus one. It's 1.4 divided by 0 0.4. So this exponent is now larger than one, which means that the temperature ratio, which is a value which is smaller than the pressure ratio gives you a high pressure ratio around 60 here in this case. Okay, so the isentropic relation that we need to use is P03 is equals T03 divided by T02 to the power of gamma divided by gamma minus one. And you can see here, if you rewrite this, you get the other way around. You get P03 divided by P02, kappa minus one divided by kappa. Okay. Also something you would have to use for the homework assignment, pretty, basic if you have followed thermodynamics uh, not such a long time ago and then you will still remember all of these relations and this is something you will need to use uh, for the compressor and for the turbine these equations are different if you can see um, for the compressor and for the turbine but you will need to use this for the homework assignment because in the homework assignment we will actually use efficiencies here and you can see that if you use an efficiency, then the efficiency also shows up here. This is the isentropic compressor efficiency, and this is the isentropic turbine efficiency. Now, the next uh, bit more complicated, uh, um, where can we find the formula sheet? Is it gamma or kappa? In uh, the convention is that you can use both. You can use gamma and kappa. Even in books, you will find sometimes both versions. Some books only use gamma, some use books only use kappa. But uh, the, um, it doesn't really matter if, as long as you know what it is and as long as you are persistent and you know that gamma is nothing else than 
gamma, which is the same as kappa, is the same as C D divided over C D for only for an ideal gas. Okay. Because it's one I you can derive this form from an isentropic process, you can derive this equation. And uh, uh, the formula sheet, I'm not so sure if, uh, yes, there is a formula sheet. There's also, I mean, if you look at the reader, Sike Klein in the first lecture showed you the books that you can use. One of the books is uh, Dixon and Hall. And there you will find a bunch of equations that are necessary to know this. Thermodynamic books, basic thermodynamic books, first year bachelor, Morgan and Chapio also has this uh, equation seen there. And the reader, from Jos van Bouten and that is also online on Brightspace, you can find the reader and in the reader you have also these equations, but you can always derive these equations yourself as well. Probably it's faster to derive them yourself than looking them up somewhere. Or if you write them down and make your own sheet, then you can also do that. Uh, the way we're gonna do the exam now, since it's online, I'm not sure how this will work out. Um, uh, but, um, uh, probably it will be an open book exam because we cannot check when you sit on at home online uh, in front of your computer, we cannot check, uh, you're not allowed to check actually what you're doing while you do the exam. So it's going to be an open book exam, which means that you can use all the books and all the equations that you want. Okay. I think so. You need to ask the client for this, but I think this will be like that. Now, um, the other a bit more complex uh, concept and very difficult to understand also for students because when I ask a question uh, about this in the exam, very often students will not get this right. But uh, it's a concept that you will need to use in the homework assignment uh, when you calculate the work required in the turbine or in the ex ex extracted in the turbine or required in the compressor, right? How much work you need in order to compress a certain substance from one pressure to the other pressure and given a certain efficiency, how much work is acquired, right? And um, the best way to explain this is um, using um, this thing here. So you imagine, we, as I showed you before, you have seen the compressor, the booster, and the booster had three stages, right? So which means that I can split up this pressure ratio here. So this is P1 and let's call this one P final. Yeah, that's fine, it's P2, okay? If I had only one compressor, um, then I need to do like this. So if I had only one compressor, I would compress from here all the way here to the final point. This is point two. Point one, and I will be able to write down the efficiency. And the compressor efficiency is given here. This is the compressor efficiency, theta compressor. Okay. And we said that you always take, it always has to be less than one. So you need to take the lower temperature ratio, which is the delta T prime, this one here. delta T prime divided by delta T. And you see this compressor ratio is, uh, this compressor efficiency is quite low, it's 60% or something like that. And it would be this equation. But now we have uh, a compressor cannot uh, compress, the, of course, depends on who has designed it, but let's say the pressure ratio here would be uh, 10. So P2, let's say P2 over P1, is approximately 10. You cannot use, you can use maybe, uh, yeah, let's say if you have an XL compressor, as you have seen in the previous slides for these gas turbines, an XL compressor will not be able to do a pressure ratio of 10 in one stage because the pressure at the end of the compressor is way too high. You have the inlet of the compressor at a low pressure, outlet of the compressor at a high pressure. This high pressure fluid will just push the flow against the flow direction and you will get large separations inside the compressor because a compressor is nothing else than um, 
a diffuser, a stationary and a rotating diffuser. And if you make a diffuser flow, right, we have a diffuser flow, something like that. And I will, I will discuss this in more detail. You have flow coming in here at high speed and flow leaving here at lower speed. Pressure here is one, pressure here is two, but two is much higher than pressure one, which means here you have a much higher pressure than here. And what happens is that if this angle is too large, you will get large flow separations here. The flow will separate and you will not reach the pressure ratio that you want. You will just have a flow separation. And um, this is a problem, of course. That's why you need to split the compression into three stages. You compress one here. Then you have a, then you have a, a, a certain pressure ratio. Then you have the second stage of the compressor and you compress from here to here. You have the third compressor stage and then you compress here. Now you go to a company let's say it's to uh, MTU in Germany or to any other company uh, in Munich, let's say there's MTU and they, they design compressors and they say, okay, I can con design a compressor stage, one stage, and I can ensure that this compressor stage will have an efficiency of uh, 85%. Okay. Now we have a compressor efficiency of 85%, which means that my, sorry, not compressor, stage efficiency my stage efficiency can be defined and I do it for this guy here. The, how is the stage efficiency defined here in this case? This is my second stage, right? Second stage. My second stage is this part here. This will be an isentropic compression for the second stage, this part here. And this is the real compression with losses. So the stage efficiency which I call here eta s. Now I need to define these temperatures here. This will be delta T stage. And that guy would be a compression for this compression for the stage if you have no losses, which is this one here. And this is delta T stage prime. Okay, so I have a, all of my compressor stages have an efficiency of 85%, let's say right, 85%, but this is defined as delta T stage prime divided by delta T stage. So I have three compressors that are connect, three stages that are connect after each other. They all have an efficiency of 85%. And now if I do some derivations here, which I think will skip, uh, but you can do this uh, also at home yourself. Okay, you would need to do it at home yourself. Is that you can show that the final efficiency, this one here that we defined, the total temperature ratio. Now this is eta compressor for the total compressor. And then I have this efficiency, which is eta stage for the individual stages. I have one, two, and three stages here. You can show that for a compressor, the compressor efficiency, if you take this total, then this, this, this temperatures at the inlet and the outlet of the overall compression is smaller than the individual stage efficiencies, okay? So let's say you want to design a, a, a large gas turbine and in the large gas turbine, you would say that you won't want to have a pressure. No, it's not like that. So there's a question, wouldn't it be 0 0.85 to the power of three for this case? Uh, I don't think this is the, the, the right answer. No, you can show it. And I think it's uh, maybe a good uh, homework assignment for you also to figure that out. Or I can show you a plot now. Or maybe this is the right uh, equation. So if you say this, there's a, uh, Luca has said that uh, this, this uh, should be 0 0.85 to the power of three. It's 0 0.5 volt. Now they can check if Luca was right. So if you do these derivations, 
you will see um, the important concept on why this is like that. Let me clear the pen markings here. Is because if you, this, this, this delta t, delta t prime has a certain value, right? Is smaller than this individual delta t is summed up. The pressure lines are diverging for higher temperatures, the higher the temperature, the higher um, the, um, uh, uh, um, how do you call it? The curvature, no, the, the higher the, 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 the slope of this curve, the higher the temperature, the higher the slope, which means that these pressure lines are diverging. Because they are diverging, you can see here that this delta, this temperature difference becomes larger at higher temperatures. So if you sum this, this, and this up, delta T stage prime will be larger than delta T prime. And this is the proof that eta compressor is smaller than eta stage. And Luca has said that the value is 0 0.614. If eta stage is 0 0.85, then eta C should be 0 0.614. Let me go and check this one. You can also derive this equation. So you can derive an equation now that actually tells you how these two efficiencies are linked among each other. And now I've not used the stage efficiency, but I have used this efficiency. This is eta infinity. If I have not only three stages, but if I assume that I can make each stage infinitely, infinitesimally small, then I have the uh, polytropic efficiency and the polytropic efficiency is the one that I use if I design compressors. Okay, and you can see this is the polytropic efficiency, this is the compressor efficiency. And if I assume a polytropic efficiency of my stage efficiency 0 0.85, let's say, uh, then I should be close to the value that uh, Luca here has suggested because Luca has uh, suggested that this uh, stage is three, right? No, I think this equation will actually not work. Then I should get a compressor efficiency which is lower than this value. And let's see here, I can explain you this now in this diagram. You have the isentropic efficiency. Let's say this is eta compressor. This is the pressure ratio here. Increasing pressure ratio one, and this will be a compressor ratio of 30 on this part here. And now I say here, this is the polytropic efficiency. This one here, polytropic efficiency. You can see here. And the first polytropic efficiency is 80. The other one is 85. And the other one is uh, 90 here, which is this one. Right? So now we are along a line. And so as you see, it also depends on the, uh, so this equation is uh, definitely not correct. Uh, Luca, you need to prove it to me that uh, you are right, but I don't think it will work because it should be a function of the pressure ratio. If the pressure ratio is, uh, uh, but thank you uh, nevertheless uh, that we discussed this. So it's a, a good uh, point that you had here. But uh, so you look at uh, a polytropic efficiency of 80 point, uh, uh, 85%. I will get a final, com for, for pressure ratio of 20, I will get a final pressure rate for the compressor 78. Okay. <clears throat> so this, uh, Efficiencies, of course, they depend on the pressure ratio. The higher the pressure ratio, the larger this um, um, deviation becomes. Okay. And the same for the turbine. So, which means that if you if you have uh, uh, if if you go to a manufacturer and the manufacturer tells you, okay, I can make a stage efficiency of the compressor. How can the total efficiency for a turbine be higher than the polytropic efficiency? So you have seen that for the compressor, maybe uh, you can uh, understand it, that if you have a stage that has 85% and you put five of these stages together, the total compressor efficiency will be smaller. But why is this different for a turbine? If, the, if a turbine manufacturer says, okay, I can make a, a turbine efficiency for a stage of uh, 85%, and I have a pressure ratio for the turbine. This is now the turbine line. This is a turbine line, okay? I have a pressure ratio of 20. I have a polytropic efficiency. Each turbine stage has an efficiency of 
okay? Then you will see that the turbine efficiency is actually higher than the single stage. It's 90%. And this has to do with the recovery factor in, in steam turbine manufacturers because a steam turbine usually has many stages. And um, uh, in, in steam turbine design, this has been called the recovery uh, factor. And I think I dis, uh, discuss it here. So if you look at this slide 23, then you can see why this is the case. The case. So you can see that um, if you have one, the first stage of the turbine is here. Now we are expanding, right? The first stage of the turbine, an isentropic expansion would end up at this temperature, but a expansion with losses ends up here at higher temperature. So actually some of the losses, some of this kinetic energy of the flow has been converted into internal energy of the flow, made it higher. So the internal energy has become higher of the flow which means that the second stage actually has a higher internal energy to expand in the second stage than if you had a isentropic expansion, this one here. Clear? And this is so-called reheat factor. That's why the overall turbine efficiency is higher than the individual stage efficiencies for turbine. Clear? Yari has said clear. Uh, then I will skip this part, okay? I will skip this part and I will discuss the homework. <clears throat> and um, are there any other questions? So what did I discuss? I discussed the uh, I, I, I repeated again the basic four basic cycles that we have. Um, let me answer to this person here, otherwise he's gonna. Will the lecture two be put into Google Drive? Yes, it will be. So what did I want to say? Um, I discussed uh, the four cycles again, the basic cycle, the reheat cycle, uh, with the cycles with intercoolers and with, um, with the reheat, as I said, and the recuperated cycle. And I told you that the, most of the compression and the expansion actually works with uh, losses. So you need to take into account the losses and you need to characterize these losses with an efficiency, as in tropic efficiency, usually you need to have pressure losses that you need to take into account. And uh, also the thing is since a compressor, compressor turbines also have many stages, but compressors have many more stages because a compressor is a diffuser. And I said it already, a diffuser is uh, more difficult to, to make uh, work properly. This is a diffuser. In a diffuser, you need to make sure that this opening is not happening too fast. Otherwise you will get flow separation here and flow separation here. But in a nozzle, which is a turbine, you don't need to have, you don't have these restrictions. You can make a nozzle like that, very small velocity here and very high velocity here, and there will be no flow separation in the nozzle. But in a diffuser, you will. That's why you have so many compressor stages. Because if you make a compressor stage that looks something like that, you will have a large flow separation. So you need to have many compressor stages that do like that. Diffusers after each other many diffusers after each other with a very small opening angle so that you don't get flow separation. And that's why you have 16 compressor stages and maybe four turbine stages, okay? But since we have so many compressor stages, you cannot uh, uh, a priori say, okay, if you have a compressor stage with a certain efficiency, then the final efficiency of the whole compressor will be the same because you need to use the polytropic efficiency. That's why we have the polytropic efficiency. And that's why we have this homework assignment. And this is the homework assignment. And let me open this one here. So the first assignment is as follows. You have a simple Brayton cycle. This is just, again, a repetition. A simple Brayton cycle consists of compression, heat addition, and expansion. This is what Gustavo wrote here some years ago. 
But then you have also different ones, which we discussed already. You have a recuperator, reheat, and intercooling, right? So the uh, assignment now is as follows that uh, you can, yeah, I should have uh, maybe uh, updated this a bit because um, you can form groups of two students or so the master students. Maybe you can work together on this topic or you can work alone. I don't know. We need to discuss this with the secret client also. If you have questions, please post them. Uh, send the email to, to uh, Luke, to Sika Klein or to me about this homework assignment. Maybe there's also a discussion board on Brightspace, but again, the discussion board on Brightspace is not accessible to all of the people listening from outside the university. We also have a lot of uh, uh, participants from outside the university. You will not be able to get Brightspace access. Uh, so send an email then to us, but I think you can work alone on this uh, homework assignment or if you find somebody you can work together and you can choose what you want. But what we have is a, a cycle, um, basic cycle, and in the basic cycle you would need to add um, two things. So you would need to uh, have a basic cycle as a starting point, right? Something like that. And you need to add intercooler for the number one. You need to add an intercooler and a recuperation, which means you need to have a cycle like that and recuperation. That would be number one. The second cycle would be reheat plus recuperation. So you would have a cycle that would do something like that in a TS diagram. Okay. And then you have. As this cycle or this cycle, and then you compare it to the basic cycle. So implement a um, cycle into the MATLAB tool that is provided on Brightspace for the master students. You can use the MATLAB tool, but we also have an Excel tool and the Excel tool will be also made available on uh, the Google Drive. Sika Klein has also given you already a, a Excel sheet and in this Excel sheet, these things are already implemented and then you can play around with them yourself, okay? But the master students uh, from TU Delft, you can either use the MATLAB tool or the Excel tool. I will show you this in a second. Uh, and then once you have implemented the new cycle, so this, the, the, we, give, we provide you with some tools already in Excel and MATLAB, which has implemented the basic cycle without recuperation, without intercooling or reheat. You add it yourself. And then you check, uh, you answer these questions. What is the impact of the cycle if you add this? If you add reheat, if you add recuperation, how does the efficiency change? Is the efficiency much higher? Is the efficiency lower than before, et cetera, et cetera? How does it compare to the basic Brighton cycle? You need to discuss this, okay? Then what is the difference? Between, what is the effect of changing the pressure ratio? Of course, you have a certain cycle and you change the pressure ratio. I will show you in a second how this works. And which one is better? Is the basic cycle better than a cycle with uh, reheat? Or is a basic cycle worse than a cycle with reheat? When would you use reheat? When would you use a recuperator? And for that, you need to make a homework. And so you would need to hand in a report, which is no longer than four pages. Okay. You can use MATLAB or Excel, as I said. And uh, then you have several assumptions also. You can say that there's no pressure loss in the, in the combustion chamber because it makes things much more complicated. But you need to specify a polytropic efficiency for the compressor and the polytropic efficiency for the turbine. And um, uh, you can assume something, okay? You can say that you have a, a, a certain efficiency for these things. Yeah? And now let me show you how this will work. If you go to Brightspace, I will not to go to Brightspace right now. <clears throat> I will not go to Brightspace, but if you go on Brightspace and you look at assignment number one, so you should be able to find on Brightspace assignment number one. For the external participants, you will go to the Google Drive and on Google Drive, you will also find assignment one and inside there, you will find the assignment plus the Excel, that, uh, the Excel uh, table that uh, Seeker client prepared, okay? When is the deadline for the assignment? That's a good one. So I would say that uh, uh, two weeks. Uh, okay, so two weeks. In two weeks, you will have the, to hand in the assignment in two weeks from, from now on. You have two weeks time to hand it in. 
it has been recorded now, I will maybe also ask Secret Line to post this again. The Excel find is not present on Brightspace, then we will have make it accessible, but the MATLAB probably should be there. Is the MATLAB there? MATLAB is there. Okay, the Excel sheet, we also make it available. Um, but so one student has confirmed that MATLAB is there. And if you open the MATLAB thingy, then you will see something like this. Can you see this MATLAB uh, window now with the diagrams and the sliders? Can you please give me a hand up? Okay, yes, I can see a yes from Blast. Okay, so you can see that part here. And this is now the MATLAB tool, which is actually uh, quite, um, um, you can do a lot with it already. And um, the way to explain this now to you is you can see on the left side, you have a temperature entropy diagram. The ones that we always use, temperature entropy, right? It would be better to use a HS diagram here, but it's fine. Temperature entropy diagram. You can see these lines now in the temperature entropy diagram of the pressure. One bar, two bar, four bar, uh, six, eight bar, 16, 32, and 64 bar. You can see that one here, 64 bar. This is one bar. Okay, so these are the isobars. So now you can see what happens if you have a compression from ambient temperature and ambient pressure to, what was this, two, four, eight bar. And you can see that the eight bar is the pressure ratio that is, uh, that is put here. So you can see what happens if I increase the pressure ratio to 11. You can see what happens if I increase the pressure ratio to 16. I hope you can see these numbers and the broadcast is good enough, but you can go up to a pressure ratio of course of 64. Okay. So you see you have, you can easily change these kind of things here, change the pressure ratio and the cycles in the TS diagram will change. On the right side, you see the efficiency of that cycle. The MATLAB tool, we will make it available on Google Drive as well, but I'm not sure if you will have access to, to MATLAB if you are from outside. If you have access to MATLAB for the people from outside, then of course you can also use the MATLAB tool. Yeah. Okay, and there was a question. Is MATLAB tool available on Google Drive? No, not yet. I will, we will do this all, all now. But give me these five minutes to explain now. To Of course, interrupt me if you have questions. But I, uh, let me use these five minutes now to explain um, uh, this, 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 uh, the way this works. So, for example, I told you before that if you have a, a cycle with a very high pressure ratio, and I put here 64, let's say an extremely modern aircraft engine, you can see that the pressure, the efficiency, if you have no losses, is 69% here. Can you see my mouse hopefully as well? 69.52%. So aircraft engines go for high efficiency. But you can see that the point of maximum specific work on this, on this diagram here is at 1.19, somewhere here. But the maximum specific work is actually here, somewhere, at uh, pressure ratio 15. And I can check, look, let me go uh, and decrease the pressure ratio. You can see that this point here goes towards the left side and I can actually check what is the pressure ratio that gives me approximately maximum uh, specific work. This is the pressure ratio when the temperature, the outlet of the turbine of the compressor here is the same as the outlet of the turbine here. When these two temperatures are the same, you have maximum work. Now you can see that I have uh, two cycles in here. I have a black cycle and a red cycle. So you can see all this black font here belongs to the black cycle. This is this part here and the red cycle. I have two cycles. And now I've said here a checkbox. Can you see this checkbox? I have same as cycle one. If I uncheck this one, I can have two different cycles and compare them among each other. Now let's say I want to have a cycle with a higher pressure ratio. Now the red cycle has a pressure ratio of 64. You can see how it has changed the maximum, the inlet temperature of the compressor and the outlet temperature of the compressor or inlet temperature of the turbine are the same because this is something I fixed with the temperature ratio. And then you can see these are the two cycles and I can compare them among each other. I can see here, for example, the black cycle has an efficiency of 54%, but it has a much higher specific work, 1.53 compared to 1.19 for the red cycle. I hope you can see that. Right? So the red cycle has a higher efficiency, but a lower specific work. Now you can also say, okay, what happens if I actually uh, change the compressor efficiency? You can see here, there's compressor efficiency, efficiency of the turbine here. 
pressure ratio and so on and so forth. The only two things that you will need is these two guys. So I changed the pressure ratio, sorry, I changed the efficiency of the compressor and make it for the black cycle 8%. Okay, so let me, 80%, let me do it uh, the other way. So let, let's make two cycles that have the same pressure ratio. Let's say we have a modern aircraft engine. We have a modern aircraft engine with a very high pressure ratio. And uh, the red cycle is an ideal cycle. So the compressor has no losses. These people were able to build a compressor, which is very good. Then you can see that the specific work, the efficiency of the red cycle is 70%, while the efficiency of the black cycle, which has an efficiency of the compressor of 90%, has dropped from 70% here at overall efficiency to, efficiency to 58. So now you can ask yourself, is it important actually to put a lot of money to increase the, to increase the efficiency of the compressor for a, a gas turbine that is propelling an aircraft? I would say yes. A small change in efficiency of the compressor for a high pressure ratio cycle has an extreme effect on the overall efficiency. Okay, 1% point gives, I don't know how many percentage points here. Let's say I change the black cycle from 93% as a polytropic efficiency for the compressor. I have a black cycle that has approximately 63%. I increase the efficiency for the compressor and I go up here. I go up further. So you see that for high pressure ratio cycle, the efficiency of the compressor is very important. On the other hand, if I have uh, cycles with a low pressure ratio, the efficiency of the compressor is almost uh, doesn't have a lot of effect. Wait a second. Where is it now? You see here. So I have a compressor for the red cycle of 100% and for the black cycle is uh, almost 90%. And you can see that the efficiency here is not so much different. Okay. So this is a tool that you can download and play around. But now once you download this MATLAB tool, you will find uh, several files and the file that you would need to change is uh, uh, this thingy here. So you will get, uh, this is the basic cycle. This is, okay, no, sorry, you probably don't see it. Let me share the screen, the whole screen. I'm not sure if it's uh, big enough, but if you open MATLAB, you will see this is the basic cycle, the function of the basic cycle, which implements all of these things that we discussed. Okay, you calculate the turbine uh, power, the, the compressor power required, the calculate the cycle efficiency and all of these things. And uh, you will get a file here in this directory, which says put here your cycle, okay? You would need to implement your cycle if you uh, use the MATLAB. You need to implement your cycle here. It, for this one has been already done. You can see here, this has been done for this cycle. Uh, and for example, if I use a recuperated cycle, then you get this part here. So you can see that you will have this pull down menu and in this pull down menu, you can choose a bunch of different cycles and then you can compare these two different cycles among each other. And then you can make a, um, uh, discussion in your paper that you need to submit. You need to submit a report of four pages. And in this report, we want you to discuss these kind of things. Is the efficiency of the compressor very important for the overall efficiency? Or is the turbine efficiency more important for this work? Or is it uh, important to have a recuperator and so on and so forth? Okay. Are there any questions? Because now it's uh, time is up. I wait a bit. If you have some questions, please let me know. You can write them in your, uh, put them in your chat. In the same time, maybe in the meantime, I can show you the Excel sheet. This is uh, the Excel sheet, okay? You can see here for the Excel, you have a similar stuff. I hope you can see the Excel now because I'm sharing the whole screen. Uh, again, temperature entropy diagram, 
Uh, in Excel now, this is uh, something that SIG has uh, made uh, quickly for the students or for the participants of this course who don't have access to MATLAB. Then you can use also uh, this Excel sheet and you will have to put here your own cycle calculations. Okay. In order to study these two different cycles, as I said, you have the basic cycle and then you need to add to the basic cycle intercooler or reheat and the recuperator. If there are no questions, then uh, I would say that we stop here. The deadline I would say is two weeks, but uh, if uh, the, this will change, then you will hear from us. Anyway, I will give the next lecture on Tuesday. And on Tuesday, I will finish with uh, this part and maybe start looking at this homework assignment so we can discuss it already next Tuesday if you have any questions. If there are no more questions, then I would say we stop here. Was everything clear then? Hands up. Okay, I get, thank you, uh, hands up. Still not from everybody though. Okay, but it's okay. Maybe I've not looked fast enough. Then, bye-bye. See you next time on Tuesday. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.